Uh, my uh, task today is really to try and um, make sure that the afternoon shift, that everybody's awake for the, the two o'clock shift, which is always the most difficult for a conference speaker. And uh, as a result, I will try to be a, a little bit provocative. My comments are based uh, mainly on the congressional testimony you see before you uh, that I had the honor to deliver uh, recently uh, on the Hill. Uh, the testimony, the hearing was called by the House Armed Services Committee to assess the last 10 years of the war and uh, what we've done well, what we have not done well, and the way ahead. Let me uh, preface what I have to say by thanking the hosts and the sponsors and the captain for coming up with this wonderful idea. Uh, it has uh, been an impressive conference so far in, in the experts and, and the thoughts that have been uh, shared today. Um, what I do have to say, because of the various hats I wear, that nothing I'm about to say necessarily reflects the U.S. government or Department of Defense policy. Hopefully some of it might, but none of it necessarily does. Um, first question, why are we here? Why uh, should we be discussing counterinsurgency on a, a beautiful day in South Carolina? Well, very much for that reason, that America is still in the longest armed conflict it has been engaged in since 1776. We need to recognize that fact. Whether we don't like the label of global war on terror, whether we prefer other labels, uh, uh, overseas contingency operations, whether we are very happy about the Afghan drawdown uh, for 2014, the fact is uh, men and women in uniform are still giving their lives and risking everything in South Asia and in Iraq under the auspices of a campaign that began exactly 10 years ago and one week ago. So Friday last week was the beginning of those operations and they are still ongoing. The second reason is for the theme of the conference I think is, is very apt. Um, FM 324, the field manual on counterinsurgency for the US Army and the US Marine Corps, is perhaps the sexiest doctrinal document ever written. It was downloaded on the internet by two million users in the first seven days of its release. FM 324 was found in caves used by the Taliban in the uh, Afghan Fatah region within months of it being released. It is related to somebody who could be deemed a rock star in the national security world, and that is General Petraeus now the Director of uh, Central Intelligence at the CIA. So that's another good reason. Uh, there's a historic reason and there's a doc doctrinal one with regards to FM324. Uh, let me share with you what I've discovered looking at the question of counterinsurgency in the last five years since it became such a hot button issue. I came to this question of counterinsurgency not as an expert in COIN. I built my career on counterterrorism. My background is the intersection between grand strategy and terrorist groups. So understanding how terrorist actors think strategically, how they communicate strategically, and how to defeat them, which is an element of irregular warfare, but it's a subset of irregular warfare. So five years ago, I came to COIN as a neophyte from the outside, and perhaps that was uh, what, what made uh, my, my publications a little bit more, more controversial than most. The first thing I did when I realized that this is, this is the topic to talk about in Washington, is counterinsurgency and David Petraeus. As I sat down and I looked at the science of how this doctrine was built. What does counterinsurgency mean? What is the source, the data, for counterinsurgency doctrine? And how well has there been a, uh, a scientific rigor demonstrated by those who have written counterinsurgency doctrine under the guidance of names we now know, such as John Nagel and others? The first thing that, that struck me is the data set that was used to construct Western counterinsurgency. If we get into a very interesting discussion today about Eastern and Western concepts of war, what we're discussing here today, at least what I will be discussing, is the American approach to counterinsurgency, which is more broadly speaking, the Western approach. And as I started reading all the books I could find on counterinsurgency, Tronquier, Galula, Kitson, Caldwell, something very uh, interesting struck me that almost all of the most influential writings on counterinsurgency were based upon 16 irregular conflicts in the 20th century. <coughs> and you know them all very well. They've been mentioned today. 
Malaya, Indochina, Northern Ireland, so on and so forth. But then I looked at, okay, 16 conflicts informed French, British, American, Belgian concepts of counterinsurgency. Were those the only irregular conflicts in that time period? And even if you just do a very cursory Google search, if you go to the Marine Corps' Small Wars Research Center, you find that in the period that Western counterinsurgency doctrine was being written, the 20th century, there were, on conservative estimates, 220 conflicts in that time frame. Okay, so we had 220 wars outside of the total wars of World War I and World War II <coughs> that happened in that time frame. Nevertheless, 90% of counterinsurgency analysis and doctrine was built upon 16 famous cases. Some more adventurous authors and analysts looked at more uh, unusual conflicts, Kashmir, uh, Afghanistan, and the Soviets, and so forth. But even if you expanded it, 20, 20 were the conflicts that were used to build our doctrine today. 20 out of 220, less than 10%. So number one, there's an issue of data sets. There were many conflicts that were left out of our discussion of irregular warfare in the 20th century that I could see no good scientific reason for them being left out. In most cases, these were conflicts that were labeled <coughs> revolutions. Okay, whether it's the Iranian Revolution, the Hungarian Revolution, the Russian Revolution, for some reason, those were left to historians. Revolutions are dealt with by political scientists or, or, or historians. But why? Well, what's the big difference between a revolutionary and a counterinsurgent? Can anybody tell me? Who wins? Yeah, the revolutionary <laughs> is the one guy who wins. Okay? So I don't think that's very scientific, personally, that we put that category of conflict into a box called revolution. We don't analyze it with relevance to what we're doing today because Trotsky and Lenin and Stalin won. Therefore, they're not insurgents. Okay? I don't think that's scientifically sound. So that's my first observation with regards to the Western counterinsurgency doctrine. So it's a data set issue. Second one is even more problematic. If you take all of these famous cases upon which the counterinsurgency doctrine were built, what you can really call them, because that is what we used to call them before David Petraeus, before 9-11, is uh, post-colonial policing actions. That is what counterinsurgency used to be called. called. Post-colonial policing actions. Now, why did we call these kinds of wars under that title? Well, because that is what they were. Look at the best example, the one that influenced FM 324 the greatest, Algeria. Algeria is the quintessential Western counterinsurgency case study. <coughs> now, what happened in Algeria? Violence erupted in a territory which was under the sovereign, constitutional, and legal mandate of the French Republic, the département of northern Algeria. Why did France deploy forces to Algeria? To do what? To do something very simple. Suppress the violence that had erupted to reinstate the status quo ante. French Forces were deployed, and this is classic colonial policing actions, to suppress emergent violence and re-establish the conditions prior to the eruption of violence. <coughs> How much does that look like Afghanistan or Iraq? In two fundamental ways, it doesn't. Firstly, neither Afghanistan or Iraq were colonial territories of the United States. There was no constitutional, historic, ethnic, uh, tradition-based connection to these land masses. Secondly, when we deployed those special forces and those CIA paramilitary teams 10 years ago and one week ago, did we go in there to recreate the status quo ante? Did we go in there to put the Taliban back in power 
Did we go to Iraq to put Saddam Hussein back in the palace? No. We went there to do something which I call nation formation. Not even state building. It is way past state building and stability operations. We went into those two countries to create wholly new economic, social, and political realities. Wholly new economic, social, and political realities. So the question I ask is, how relevant, therefore, is Algeria to telling us what we should do in Afghanistan or Iraq? How much is the experience of French soldiers in Algeria or British soldiers in Northern Ireland or in Malaya relevant to the mission we have set ourselves in these two countries? So we can raise, we can take the discussion to an even higher level, an even higher strategic one. Should we be doing COIN? What I would say first is, we're not doing COIN. We're not even doing COIN 2.0. We are in a completely new ball game, making sure that there are elections in Afghanistan, girls can go to school, and it is not illegal to listen to music on the streets, is not counterinsurgency. It is way beyond counterinsurgency. So whatever we want to call it, nation formation, whatever label you want to give it, the question is, should we be doing it? Now, that's a question we can't answer in this room. That is a grand strategic political question. But let me reflect upon what the United States government says about the mission it has undertaken for the last 10 years and whether it will be doing it again in the future. And there are some disturbing signs, and they are contradictory signs as well. If you read the latest QDR, the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is the highest level strategic document of an unclassified nature that comes out of the Pentagon, one thing is clear. In the future, this great nation will do everything. <laughs> and I mean everything. We are going to do more Afghanistans. We're going to do more Iraqs. We're going to get ready to fight war on the Korean Peninsula. We're going to get ready to deploy naval assets against China in the South China Sea. We are going to save the environment, the polar bears, the penguins, everything. Everything. For a very good, very objective analysis of the problems with the QDR, uh, I, I uh, recommend uh, Richard Schultz and Roy Godson's uh, piece in the Joint Forces Quarterly about two issues ago on the problems with the QDR. The QDR is the antithesis of strategy. And I find it quite ironic that for eight years, the people who currently wrote the latest QDR were sitting outside of government, moaning about how bad the Bush administration's QDRs were. And then we have a new administration. The people who've been complaining for eight years come in, and they write, write a QDR that's worse than the previous ones. It is a shopping list, a shopping list of everything we want to see happen. That is not strategy. As was said today by one of our speakers, strategy is making choices, making difficult, unpopular choices, <clears throat> prioritizing things. Some countries are more important than other countries from the point of view of national interest. Why did we go to Afghanistan? Why on earth did we care about Afghanistan? For only one reason, not because the girls couldn't go to school. Because 3,000 people died in 102 minutes on the streets of New York and Washington, and in Pennsylvania. Why are we still there is the correct question. And I put it to you, it's not because girls should go to school, although that is a laudable thing we should try to promote. The national interest is to make sure that territory is never, ever used again to execute mass casualty attacks against the United States. That has to be our strategic intent. And that's how we measure our success or our failure with regards to that mission. So the QDR is, is, is not a good guide for the future. However, let me share with you what I've heard recently, and this is hot off the press. This is information of an of a informal nature, no sources, um, no names. But in the last two weeks, with the enormous economic pressure on the Defense Department, on the government, on the White House, there are already, at very high levels, inside Washington, uh, noises being made that September the 11th, Afghanistan and Iraq were the anomalies that we need to get back to 1991. People in uniform are making open statements 
that what we did in 1991 in the Gulf is the future of warfare, sending uh, special operators on, uh, on donkeys with uh, real-time laptops into the mountains. That's, we don't do that anymore. That was the anomaly. That's unusual. Well, let me just share with you one slide, if I may. Uh, this is from a paper, another a JFQ paper, and I'm not going to do the usual Department of Defense uh, death by PowerPoint. I'm just going to sh show you <laughs> one slide, which is a summation of uh, something called the Correlates of War Database. The Correlates of War Database is an unclassified, uh, university-run, a huge data crunching machine where they collect simply objective statistical information on every conflict since the time of Napoleon. So numbers, duration, casualty, and so forth. And as you will see when the slide reaches you, here we go, something very interesting <coughs> about the last three and a half centuries of what, given this morning's discussion, we could call the Westphalian way of warfare. Uh, what uh, David Kilcullen and I did in this article is we took the, the huge amount of data from the Correlates of War database and we tried to represent it pictographically on, on one illustration. And what you have in front of you is a box, a colored box that shows, summarizes the last three and a half centuries of conflict uh, as recorded by the database. Fundamentally, the important thing to notice are the proportions there are three categories of conflict uh, that, are, that are listed. They are state against state, state against non-state actor, and non-state actor against non-state actor. Okay, so countries fighting each other, countries fighting groups, and groups fighting each other. The fundamentally important conclusion of almost 400 years of conflict is the size <laughs> of the blue territory on the box. 80% of all conflict since Napoleon has been nations fighting non-state actors. What we term technically irregular warfare. 80%. The red is a tiny fraction. State on state. The non-state against non-state is even more. But still a fraction. So, and others have written on this, but, but it still hasn't sunk into the, the policymaking communities in Washington and elsewhere. The fact is, what we call irregular warfare is regular. The history of modern warfare, and John Keegan wrote this in the intro introduction to his book, uh, the, the, the History of Warfare, that we must understand giant armies with tanks fighting each other that's the anomaly, not September the 11th. You know, the Sibesa Gap fight between NATO and the Second Red Army of the Soviet Union, that's unusual. The Somme is unusual. The Korean War is unusual. Everything else is regular. Now, there's a very good explanation for this that, that Dave Kukala, my friend, uses. Um, irregular warfare. Mm -hmm. Well, who regulates warfare? States regulate warfare. So that's why we call conventional warfare what it is, because the laws of war apply to who? States. States sign the Geneva and Hague Conventions. Al-Qaeda never signed the Geneva or Hague Conventions, and neither did Hezbollah. So there's a kind of tautologist aspect to this. What we call regular is only regular because we regulated it, because we were the only regulators. But if you look at the facts, I think they speak for themselves. Whatever we plan to do, whatever the next QDR looks like, we need to be prepared for the fact that the future will most likely be irregular, look more like September the 11th, look more like Afghanistan. The question we need to answer, therefore, is which one of these are important? <coughs> which part of the world count and which nation state actors count? I'll, I'll, I'll leave, I'll uh, close, and, then, and maybe you have some questions. The last point is... Um, labels. I've only lived in America for three years. I've just become eligible to become a citizen of this great nation. And, and one thing I learned very quickly is that you guys love your bumper stickers. 
Okay? <laughs> Everything has to be boiled down to a 12 by 3 inch piece of plastic. Okay? And that's why we had what? one of the ugliest acronyms known to man, the Global War on Terror, which we could discuss for hours. It's problems with it, the legal problems with it, the strategic communications uh, issues with it. But let me, let me uh, return to this much maligned uh, bumper sticker for the post-September 11th strategic world. Global war on terror. Yes, it's a problem. But what the president, the last president said in one speech, which he never uh, elucidated on later, was he flipped the order of the words in that bumper sticker. And once, he, instead of saying the global war on terror, he actually said that this is a war against global terror. Think about that for a second. Not a global war on terror, a war on global terror. That is a far more accurate description of the next 50 years. We are not fighting all terrorists. Okay, the last time, when was the last time you know, Delta Force was deployed against the Basque separatists in Catalonia? I, 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 can't, I can't remember that, right? When was the last time we used, you know, SEAL Team 6 to protect abortion clinics from violence? Didn't happen. So we're not fighting all terrorists. Who are we fighting? Those non-state actors who have global ambitions and global reach. That's the important laser-like definition that we've lost. We are fighting those groups that have global ambitions, religious or otherwise, look at what happened in D.C. this week with regards to Tehran, global ambitions and global capabilities. And that should give us a little bit more um, meat with which to define the tasks ahead, and hopefully they won't all, they won't all be shopping lists in the next uh, QDR. So um, you have the, the testimony in front of you uh, that goes into far more detail, but I'd be glad to, to uh, try and uh, field any of your questions uh, here and now. I think you deeply mischaracterized the QDR. Uh, I, I knew you'd say that. <laughs> I, I would say that, it's true, but, but, but I, nonetheless, I think you do. I think, I think you're quite right to state that the QDR notes that we are likely to face everything, or an unpredictable subset of, anything, of everything at any rate. But I think that the, the fundamental point of the QDR is precisely the opposite of the way you put it. Uh, the point is not that we don't make choices. The point of the QDR is saying that against this context in which we will face an unpredictable subset of, ev of everything, we must nonetheless make choices, and that the challenge for us now becomes, in this much more complex globalized world, precisely how we balance risks, where, which, what we decide is more probable than other things, how we make strategic investments, predicated precisely on the recognition that we cannot do everything, we cannot prepare equally for every possible threat, so we have to make choices. And I could blab on about the QDR and some of the specific choices that that framework is driving. But I think that the risk management perspective that underlies that is, is not only, you know, I, I guess, I, well, let me turn my comment into a question, I suppose, and say, I wonder if you disagree with the idea that we face an unpredictable subset of everything yeah. and that the only, the only possible action in the face of that recognition is then to make some of those hard choices about how, where, you bound, where you put your investments because we, we know we can't do everything. No, thank you. I, look, I, I have a, a piece coming out exactly on this issue which uh, my co-authors and I call the complexity cult. And, and uh, it's fighting the complexity cult and I think the QDR falls into this trap and that's exactly the mes message of uh, Gottsen and Schultz in their article. My reading of the QDR is exactly reflected by what you just said. There is a statement made that the world is so complex uh, we can't predict it. We have to prepare for all kinds of eventualities and make the choices within those. I fundamentally deny that. I fundamentally deny the assertion that the world is more complex today than it was in the time of Julius Caesar or in the time of Eisenhower. I just do not buy that. It is, again, a denial of strategy. The art of the strategy, strategist is to deal with complexity, not to say, the world is so complex I will put everything in my toolbox and I will use it at, at, at appropriate points when I realize which trend line is developing more aggressively than the other one. That's wrong. I mean, I'm a child of the Cold War. I can't divest myself of it. I miss it greatly. But, <laughs> but I think we, we, often, we often look back on the Cold War with incredibly rose-tinted spectacles. I, you know, so rose, it's almost you know, vermilion 
how deep it is. Why? Because it wasn't 45 years of very simple bipolarity. I mean, 1948, 1949, put yourself in the position of the US president. China's just been lost. China has just been lost to the communists. Stalin has blockaded Berlin. Sputnik is about to be launched. South A, I mean, simple. 1949, simple. Just two issues in the world. Then Korea. Then Vietnam. Then the French kicking us out of Paris. The French kicking <coughs> NATO out of Paris. You forget. I mean, you know, NATO HQ used to be in a very nice city called Paris, <laughs> not, not Brussels. Okay. So, so the idea that you know, in the age of Twitter, has brought about, brought upon us uh, uncontrollable complexity. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I, I don't think life. The speed of information flows. Yes, I get you. Okay. The speed of information flows. Right. Precision of our weapons. Okay. The, 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 the proliferation of non-state actors, understood. But non-state actors, what's tribal warfare? It's been around for a long time, yeah? Very long time. So for me, the QDR falls into that kind of trap. The world's so complicated, we're just going to have to deny making the toughest choices. The greatest leaders in the national security ar arena were always marked by one thing, the capacity to concentrate on two or three missions. That's it. That is it. Whether it was Reagan, whether it was Eisenhower, they came in and they said, I can't do everything. The world is complicated. But some countries and some issues are more important than other issues. And I think that's the art of strategy that we have to recapture. And people like Andrew Kopenovich and others are doing their, their best to try and recapture the strategic high ground. But I think the last 20 years has been described both sides of the, of the house. And I, you know, this, is, this isn't a, a party political uh, issue. This is a, a art of war issue. We have not thought strategically for 20 years in America. It strikes me that you're falling into your own trap of defining the threat too broadly and prescribing endless war against an amorphous global uh -huh. uh, I, I could be specific. Well, I think, I mean, that's, that's what you're prescribing. You want strategic clarity and precision. You want us to say we're at war with Al-Qaeda. You want us to say we're at war with possibly Al-Qaeda and its affiliates or Al-Qaeda and its, its inspirants, but not necessarily global terror. At that point, you're finding everyone from uh, Al-Qaeda to Earth First to um, oh, no, no, I said everyone global, under the I said sun. Global ambitions and global terror. As far as I'm concerned, there's only two targets in that target set. AQ and Hezbollah. I mean, if you're saying terrorism is defining the strategic interests of the United States, then I, as an analyst, would say, OK, there's only two groups of terrorists you need to deal with that have global ambitions and global outreach and capacity, and that's Hezbollah, which is active where I live in Northern Virginia. If you've read the Northern Virginia Fusion Center's report, Hezbollah is a global organization that is very much doing nasty things on the soil of this country now. The other one is AQ. AQ is a given. So uh, the specificity I can give you, right? That's not a problem. But, but as an attorney, I love to play with words. I mean, the capability to do what? To do information operations? To undermine the U.S. national about, interest. I mean, then you're talking about J.I. and you know, a lot of other folks. Um, should the U.S. really be at war with all of them? Or should you also add another component, which is some measure of U.S. interest? Oh, some absolutely. measure of materiality? Yeah, absolutely. Those that can do significant damage to the U.S. national interest, whether it's blowing people up in Cafe Milano in Georgetown, or whether it's taking down the Twin Towers, right? And isn't that materiality of judgment very similar to the risk management approach that the Pentagon's using? That is, we, we look at all the threats out there, and then we prioritize based on the materiality of that threat, the, the imminence, the likelihood of harm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the risk management approach is completely wrong. I, I, I think... That's the cart before the horse. This is not what I was asked to talk about, but, but I've always said that you start with national interest. And this is, the big, this is the big problem we haven't done for 20 years. Because we didn't have Khrushchev or Brezhnev with his finger on a button focusing us for 20 years, we didn't wake up every morning and reassert who we were and what our values were. I mean, during the whole Cold War, you had to do that. When there are 25,000 nuclear warheads targeting U.S. cities, you wake up in the morning and you reassert who your, what your values are and who threatens them. 
So my phase zero of grand strategy has always been not looking at threats. You can't start with a threat-based analysis of national security. It, it leads to all kinds of dangerous conclusions. You start with an assertion of what, what is it that makes me special? Why do I fight? What do I represent? Number one. And I, I've had, I mean, think about it, one small analogy. I've been to Fort Bragg in a room of 70 operators about to deploy within 24 hours into theater. And I've had an officer with no pangs of you know, conscience stand up in front of all his colleagues and tell me, this is my fourth rotation. I still haven't been told why I'm fighting. That's outrageous. A man who's had his fourth rotation into the sandbox, and he, I mean, he, he's decided for himself why he's fighting, but he hasn't been told clearly by his masters why it is America is sending him back into South Asia and the Middle East. That's our problem. You start with who we are, why we are fighting, and the next part of the phase zero is who, who threatens that the most? That's how you, you don't start with that. You start with values and why I fight, and then the list of threats, and then you get on to means and ways. That, that's, that's what I teach. That's my approach.